Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, on behalf of everyone at the High Commission, welcome. My name is Achilles Kajikiriago, I'm the cultural counselor. Uh, we're delighted to see a full crowd uh, tonight, and we're looking forward to tonight's very interesting lecture from Professor Cassianidou. I will leave the rest to my High Commissioner for his own welcoming remarks, but before doing so, and to cross out logistics and housekeeping out of our schedule, Please note that we don't expect any fire alarms today. So if you hear any alarm going off, please head to the nearest emergency exit. There is one behind this door, and the other one is the main entrance from, you, from where you, yeah, you came in. So uh, no fire alarms for today, and hopefully we won't hear anything. Uh, please switch off uh, your mobile phones or use the flight mode or the vibrating mode just to uh, don't disturb uh, tonight's lecture. Once again, welcome. Thank you very much for uh, keep joining us in our initiatives for, for this year. And uh, I want to welcome my High Commissioner, Evrivides Evrivides, for his own welcoming note. Thank you very much. Thank you, Achilles, and, and for the wonderful work that you're doing and, uh, and doing all the heavy lifting. He does a lot of the heavy lifting. A lot of people in this High Commission are doing a lot of the heavy lifting. Where is Andreas? Ah, one time I tried to recognize him and he's not here. Uh, but I get the credit, right? Okay, there you are. You know. uh, but I also say that I will, I will, uh, uh, um, the successes belong to the team, and any failures belong to me. So that's how we do it. But uh, Andreas, I was talking about you. I was paying tribute to you for the heavy lifting that you're doing uh, to make this, uh, all these events uh, possible. Mary, your wife, and I say that I get credit for all the successes. Uh, 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 you get credit for all the successes, but I get the, 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 the credit for all the failures. It's a great pleasure to welcome each and every one of you here uh, to the premises of the Cyprus High Commission in the United Kingdom what we call the Cyprus home uh, here in London, because uh, as I said before, home has a sense of warmth, uh, it's family, whereas high commission or a house, it's a little bit alien and a little bit foreign and a little bit cold. So to a warm welcome to each and every one of you. Many people that I know from the community, it's a great pleasure to have you. The distinguished colleague from the, from the Greek Embassy, the deputy, thank you for coming. Um, and to, of course, to welcome those that have not came here before. A uh, primary mission, of course, of the High Commission here is to, is to have a multi-layered and a multi-faceted uh, uh, multi, uh, 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 activity in diplomacy, which also naturally uh, includes uh, archaeology, also naturally includes the culture and the history of Cyprus. And, and today's event is a case in point. Uh, we would like you to be more aware of our rich, fascinating, 10 millennia year old archaeology. Uh, I am most delighted that this event of our cultural section is a synergy with the University of Cyprus and the University of College London. Um, our co-hosts, the UCL, Institute of Archaeology, and the Archaeological Research Unit of the University of Cyprus are two prominent research centers for archaeology and cultural heritage, uh, which have a leading role in the study and documentation of the human past. We do hope, and we are here to, of course, facilitate, that the collaboration between the two institutions will remain strong in a post-Brexit era without any significant changes occurring in the co-participation of the two research institutions in European projects. The recent success stories of the University of Cyprus in securing highly competitive European grants initiated a new dynamism in research, which we hope will be sustainable in the future. On the other hand, UCL, one of the most prestigious academic institutions worldwide, has been an excellent partner reinforcing research proposals and strengthening joint ventures for cutting edge research. I strongly believe that Cyprus, strategically located in the Eastern Mediterranean and at the crossroads of three continents, has a prominent role to play 
as a newly emerging, may I say, research hub, at, at, at least acting as a facilitator and as, and as a stepping stone uh, among Middle East, North Africa, and, uh, and Southern Europe. Tonight's lecture will focus on the archaeology of Cyprus through the prism of copper, its exploitation, trade, and socio-political significance from the third millennium BC to the seventh century AD and until the 20th century. Uh, if we acquire a more diachronic perspective, we will soon realize that the research outcomes presented tonight, apart from informing our understanding of the past, can also provide valuable insights into the present power games in the Levant, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Many have compared the economic significance of Cyprus's copper ore deposits during the Bronze Age to today's quest for hydrocarbons and natural gas. However, while we're still awaiting to see the new prospects of the island's hydrocarbon, uh, hydrocarbon re, uh, resources, despite the recent challenges, to put it mildly, that uh, our biggest neighbor, Turkey, is causing by challenging uh, all forms of legality, you know, when you don't have a legal leg to stand on, what do you do? You exercise gunboat diplomacy and, and yes, bullying. We hope that the situation will diffuse itself, but you know, the, the, the president, uh, under his directions, will take all actions possible to, so that the, the, uh, the drilling can go on. At any rate, um, while we're waiting to see the new prospects of the island's hydrocarbon, resor hydrocarbon resources, there is no doubt about the key role that the copper has played in the past, both for the economy of the island and its interaction with the Eastern Mediterranean and beyond. It was the oil of the period. And there is no better person to guide us in this journey back in, back in time than Professor Vasiliki Kasianidou, uh, the director of the Archaeological Research Unit of the University of Cyprus and a prominent figure in, archaeolo in archaeometallurgical research. Welcome, Carlos Orizade. <laughs> Before passing the floor to Professor Martinon Torres, welcome, it's a great pleasure to have you, of the UCL, who will formally introduce our speaker, please allow me to thank our co-sponsors for tonight's event and wish you all a pleasant, informative, and uh, um, educational uh, um, uh, evening. Uh, after the lecture, you are naturally invited to enjoy your traditional Cypriot hospitality, uh, an integral part of our identity. Very often we feed ourselves to death, but it is, <laughs> it is part of our identity. Um, uh, originating from Xenios Zeus, Xenios Zeus, which apart from academic knowledge includes also delicious Cypriot wine and canapes made with traditional culinary craftsmanship. Uh, last but not least, I also want to pay tribute to Mary, uh, the, the spouse of our distinguished colleague, Andreas, uh, for her work and her dedication to welcome each and every one of you. Uh, Mrs. Calispera, Zagathi, I'm sorry. I should have also said Calispera to you, Mrs. Calispera. Okay, and to each and every one. I know that once I start going the road of naming persons, I will put my foot in my mouth and forget. Theo from the lobby from Cyprus, so many others, so please forgive me. Welcome, and I think that's more than I needed to say because, you know, uh, I often say that the short speech moves the hearts and the long speech moves chairs. And uh, I don't want any chairs to be moved. Thank you very much and God bless. His Excellency, the High Commissioner, distinguished guests, friends of Cyprus, friends of archaeology, ladies and gentlemen, uh, allow me to start by thanking the Cyprus home and its cultural section for making this event possible and for inviting me to say a few words on behalf of UCL as I introduce our speaker. Uh, for me, and surely for many of us tonight, this event is a celebration of a long-standing and very fertile entanglement between Cyprus and University College London, as is materialized through archaeology and archaeologists. These connections are multiple, diverse and strong. Uh, they cover individuals, projects and institutions, and thankfully they don't show any sign of waning. 
Only a few days ago, uh, we welcomed Dr. Mary DiComitu to UCL as a distinguished uh, Marie Curie Fellow after spending a few years as a researcher in the University of Cyprus. Just a few months before, and going in the opposite direction, Professor Tilo Reren, after serving almost 20 years at UCL as a professor, moved to Cyprus to take a position at the Cyprus Institute as director of the Science and Technology and Archaeology Research Center. The current curator of antiquities at the Department of Antiquities of Cyprus, Dr. Despina Pilides, studied at UCL. The same can be said of Professor Vasos Karageorgis, one of the most illustrious archaeologists in Cyprus, who completed his PhD at UCL before going on to do great things that we all know of. As a matter of fact, and I'll say a few more words about our speaker in just a minute, but it is worth noting that uh, Professor Cassianidou is the most recent in a dynasty of directors of the Archaeological Research Unit at UCY who were all awarded their doctorates at UCL. Professor Karageorgis, as just mentioned, after him uh, Dimitrios Mikhailidis, and most recently Lina Cassianidou herself. Indeed, every one of the first squad of permanent staff at the Archaeological Research Unit in Cyprus had previously spent some time at UCL. And the list could go on. So tonight is about Cyprus and about UCL and about archaeology. And there is, of course, no better person to embody this triangle than Professor Lina Cassianido. And I have to apologize for referring to her as uh, Lina, which is, as I've always uh, known, uh, Professor Vasiliki Cassianido. <laughs> Professor Cassianidou's studies started with a double major in chemistry and archaeology in Pennsylvania, combining two important strengths before coming to UCL for her doctoral studies. Soon after completing her PhD, she returned to Cyprus to take up a lectureship at the Department of Archaeology and Classics in 1994, and she has stayed at these universities since then, deservedly climbing up all of the academic ranks to become, in 2013, a full professor, and in 2015, the director of the Archaeological Research Unit. In addition to her roles as a teacher, mentor, supervisor, and researcher, Professor Casenido has been very active in the administration at UCY, uh, serving, among other positions, as the vice chair of the Department of the History of Archaeology, as well as a member of the UCY Senate. She is also a member of the Cyprus National Community, uh, Commission for UNESCO, and between 2014 and 2016, she served as the president of the Board of Trustees of the Cultural Foundation of the Bank of Cyprus. Throughout all of this time, she has also retained very strong links with uh, UCL, which I have personally benefited from, like uh, many of us here tonight. Because Professor Cassianito has coordinated a very good number of research projects with competitive funding from the Research Promotion Foundation or the European Union. Uh, a big highlight among many is, of course, the four-year project that became very well known through its acronym, Narnia, which is now more famous than the film. <laughs> this was a multi-million euro international training network involving nine partners from six different countries. Of course, one of those partners was UCL. And this again provided us with plenty of opportunities to exchange ideas and researchers. Narnia was then, and perhaps still is, the single largest project in the field of archaeology ever granted by the European, Communi uh, by the European Commission. Uh, Professor Cassianidou led that, and she has also led and hosted other European projects, uh, currently two uh, Marie Curie individual fellowships. One of them, currently ongoing, is uh, involving Dr. Carmen Ting, who is a UCL graduate. Currently, also, uh, Professor Cassianidou is a member of the University of Cyprus in the consortium of the MedStack project, in which UCL is also participating. This is a very ambitious, ongoing initiative that aims at establishing Cyprus as an excellence hub in archaeology and cultural heritage for the whole Eastern Mediterranean region, capitalizing on multidisciplinary research and technological innovation. Professor Cassinito's research is focused, as we all know, on ancient technology and specifically the production and trade of Cypriot copper. She has also addressed the impact of this industry 
on the Cypriot historical landscape and environment. This is a topic she has been working on from her early days as an undergraduate student in the US, but of course today she is the undisputable world reference on this subject. She has taken part on numerous field and analytical projects in the field and in the laboratory, and her work has led to numerous academic publications that include uh, two edited books, three co-authored volumes, and over 50 articles in peer-reviewed journals or book chapters. She's, of course, talking about copper tonight, and copper is an economic resource. It is the oil of the past, but it is also, and importantly, a key component of the island's natural and cultural heritage. It is copper that largely explains the prominence of Cyprus in the broader prehistory of the Mediterranean. We cannot understand the past of Cyprus without reference to copper. But I'll leave that subject to the true expert, my last few words really should be on behalf of UCL to thank Cyprus for sharing with us your outstanding archaeology and your excellent archaeologists. So now please join me in warmly welcoming our speaker for tonight, Professor Linda Cassinidou. Thank you very much, Marcos. Your Excellency, High Commissioner, I would like to thank you and thank the Cultural Counselor, Dr. Achilles Hachikiriakou, and all the team of the Cyprus High Commission, especially Mr. Andreas Iliadis, who helped organize this event. I would also like to thank Professor Marcos Martinon Torres for his kind introduction, and Professor Todd Whitelow for arranging um, that the Institute of Archaeology is a co-organizer in this event. The Archaeological Research Unit of the University of Cyprus, together with the Cyprus University of Technology, are, as Marcos has already said, collaborating with the Institute of Archaeology to win some highly competitive funding in the teaming program of H2020, which will enable us to set up this new Eastern Mediterranean Science, Engineering and Technology Center of Excellence for Archaeology and Cultural Heritage. If we manage to get through, we will have 15 million euros from the European Commission plus 15 million euros from uh, the government of Cyprus. But we will know in a year if we manage to get this. So hopefully, we will have many more opportunities to co-organize such events together. Before I start, let me just say that it's a really a great honor to be here and to be given the opportunity to share with you an important aspect of Cyprus's cultural heritage and history, which sometimes remains forgotten. So let us start our journey. In his famous book entitled Natural History and written in the first uh, okay. and written in the first century AD, Pliny the Elder states that copper was discovered in Cyprus and that Kiniras, the mythical king of the island, was the one who discovered, among other things, the art of mining. We know today that Pliny's statement is incorrect. Nevertheless, it is significant as it indicates the importance of Cyprus as a source of copper in antiquity. Even at the time when Rome had under its control so many other copper producing areas, Cyprus was so important that Pliny assumed that she could have been nothing less but the place where copper was discovered. Pliny also describes the names the different types of copper alloys available in his time, such as S. Corinthium, the Corinthian bronze, a copper alloy which was more expensive than silver. Pure copper was called S. Cyprium, Cypriot copper. Later on, this, the Romans abbreviated the name of the metal simply to Cyprium, which then sometime between the third and fourth century AD became Cuprum, with the variant Coprum, from which are derived all the Western European words for the metal. It is, of course, cuprum that the chemical symbol for the metal, Cu, comes from. In other words, copper is the metal from Cyprus. Modern geological studies have shown that the metal justly takes its Latin name from the island. The mountain range of Trodos, which covers more than a third of the island, includes some of the richest copper ore deposits in the Mediterranean. Even with today's standards, Cyprus is ranked as one of the richest countries in copper per surface area in the world. They are located within the so-called pillow lava formation, which is found around the circumference of the range and is shown here in purple. 
The copper ore deposits are located relatively close to the surface. They are easy to spot because they are covered with colorful iron oxides and they are easy to mine. These iron oxides, ochres of yellow and orange and brown umbers, were used from early prehistory until today in pottery production, as well as pigments for wall paintings, sculpture, and terracotta figurines. The Trodos mountain range includes many more economically significant mineral deposits, such as calcanthite, the copper sulfate, which were used for the preparation of medicine, medicaments, and were also systematically collected. The Trodos mineral wealth was well known in ancient times, as indicated in a passage from Pseudo-Aristotle. The ancient exploitation of the rich Cypriot copper ore deposits lasted for almost three millennia. Recent archaeological evidence clearly shows that the ancient copper industry came to an end sometime in the 7th century AD. The mines were abandoned for more than a thousand years, and it is not until the beginning of the 20th century that prospectors from the US and Europe became interested in Cypriot copper ore deposits after reading the ancient texts. They were able to locate the deposits by looking for ancient slag. This is the waste product from the smelting process. And here you see a whole mountain of it. This is certainly why, apart from towns, villages, roads, and water springs, slag heaps are noted in the first map, which was based on a full triangulated survey of the island of Cyprus and was published in 1882. This was produced by Lord Kitchener for the Foreign Office when the administration of the island of Cyprus was given to the British Empire in 1878. The impressive slag heaps, remnants of the copper industry, are found all over the foothills of the Trodos. It has been estimated that there are 4 million tons of copper slag in 40 different locations spread over the periphery of the Trodos Mountains. The copper mines were worked in antiquity and then again in the 20th century after a gap of more than a thousand years. The modern industry, however, shipped the ore abroad. There were no smelting furnaces and thus slag was never produced on the island in the 20th century. This means that all 40 million, 4 million tons of slag recorded in the foothills of the Trodos had been produced in ancient times. As already in the Bronze Age, so indeed in modern times, the mining industry soon became one of the main sources of income for the island. From the time modern mining operations started in the earlier part of the 20th century, and for a period of 40 years, 50% of the island's exports were products of the mining industry. In the same period, 15 to 25% of all the taxes collected, and 50 to 70% of income tax derived from the mining industry. In antiquity, the Trodos range was equally important for its forests, which provided fuel for the energy-demanding copper industry. Wood was the only source of fuel available for the production of copper, and Trodos was able to sustain the forests and by extend the copper industry for millennia. The forests were, of course, an important source of timber for shipbuilding, for which Cyprus was very well known in antiquity. Writing in the 4th century AD, Ammianus Marcellinus declared with admiration that the island could build and send to sea a ship fully equipped from stem to stern entirely of its own resources. Cyprus's natural wealth is eloquently described by Strabo, who was writing in the 1st century B BC. He states, and I quote, in fertility, Cyprus is not inferior to any of the islands, for it produces both good wine and good oil, and also a sufficient supply of grain for its own use. And at Damasos, there are abundant mines of copper, in which is found calcanthite and also the rust of copper, which latter is useful for its medicinal properties. Strabo also offers a detailed description of the coast of Cyprus, listing the harbors of the island and the distances from these harbors to those on the Anatolian, Syrian, or Egyptian coast. The distances are actually not great, and the Anatolian coast, as well as that of Syria, are visible from the island and vice versa. The first humans to cross the sea were hunter-gatherers who came to exploit the island's resources by the 11th millennium BC. 
By the 9th millennium BC, the first farmers came to settle, bringing with them their livestock and domesticated cereals and legumes. If one reads books and papers published before the 1990s on the Cypriot Neolithic, one will find references to Cyprus being introvert and isolated because it is an island. But new excavations have not only brought to light sites which were much earlier in date, but also solid evidence for contacts with Anatolia and Syria, which brought exotic materials to the islands, such as obsidian and carnelian. The first metal objects appear in Cyprus around 3500 BC in the Chalcolithic period. Considering the wealth of the copper ore deposits of, of Trodos, this is rather astonishing, especially in comparison to neighboring Anatolia, where native copper is, is already used from the 8th millennium BC. Equally surprising is the fact that there are less than 25 Chalcolithic copper artifacts known to date, all products of a very simple and primitive technology which weigh no more than a kilo in total. They were most probably made of native copper. The most recent find is this axe. This was just found two years ago. In the excavations of the University of Leiden at the site of Chloragas, Balures, and this dates to around 2800-2400 BC. It is a very important find as it is the largest and heaviest copper artifact found to date that comes from the Chalcolithic, and it comes from an extraordinary, perhaps ritual, deposit. The Chalcolithic period is followed by the Bronze Age. In Cyprus, this transition dates to around 2500 BC, and it comes with great changes in all aspects of Cypriot culture, namely architecture, animal husbandry, and even burial customs. There are also important developments in metallurgy. The early Bronze Age is characterized by a marked increase in metallic artifacts made of arsenical copper, which are deposited as grave goods in significant numbers. This increase in the availability of copper is the result of the development of extractive metallurgy, so the production of metal through from the ores. In Cyprus, the ores are sulfidic, and therefore a complicated process for extracting the metal is necessary. This explains why copper production on the island started so late in comparison with other areas. Once the method was mastered, however, Cyprus began to produce and export significant amounts of copper and became a major player in the Mediterranean trading networks. Copper, of course, is a sine qua non for the Bronze Age world. May I remind you that the Bronze Age has been defined as the period during which copper and copper alloys were predominant for all metal products, save those of precious metals. Recent archaeological fieldwork, analytical work, including provenance studies and philological studies of ancient texts, clearly show that developments and changes taking place in the Eastern Mediterranean and the Near East were closely linked to the need to procure copper and tin with which to produce bronze, but also silver and gold. The search for metals acted as an incentive for exploration and for establishing trading networks and systems with those areas that did not have copper or deposits of their own could have access to the metal. Frankel and Webb have long argued that the changes detected on Cyprus in the middle of the third millennium, namely the transition from the Chalcolithic to the Bronze Age, are related to the coming of a group of people who were interested to exploit the rich copper ore deposits of the island. Unfortunately, the earliest phase of the Cypriot copper industry, that dating to the third millennium, is rather elusive. Although copper must have been extracted, production was still not of a scale that could support significant exports, perhaps because of the technological complexity. Things are very different in the second millennium. Indeed, from the beginning of the second millennium, there is increasing archaeological evidence for the production of copper on the island and textual evidence for its export. Written sources suggest that Cyprus, which is called Alashia in the text of its neighbors, has already started to export copper to the east. Finally, recently published provenance analysis showed the limited use of Cypriot copper at this period in Crete and in Israel. At the same time, Cypriot pottery is found in sites of this period in the Levant, Egypt, and Anatolia. 
All this indicates that by the Middle Bronze Age, Cyprus was a part of the international trade network of the Eastern Mediterranean. This is clearly why bronze objects become more common on the island. Bronze is the alloy of copper and tin. Copper is locally available, but tin is not, which is why it indicates overseas trade connections. It must have been one of the valuable raw materials the Cypriots received in exchange for copper. The source of tin used in the Eastern Mediterranean is a matter of debate, because perhaps with the exception of the Toros Mountains, there are no known tin deposits in this part of the Old World. Some of the richest deposits are located much further to the east in modern-day Afghanistan and neighboring countries where lapis lazuli is also found. This precious bright blue colored stone was greatly sought after in the Eastern Mediterranean. A trade network was established which brought lapis lazuli and tin from the east to the Eastern Mediterranean already from the first half of the second millennium. And this is well document, documented in third millennium text from, this, from a city in Anatolia called Kulte Belkanesh. It is, however, in the second, millennium, second half of the second millennium, which corresponds to the late Bronze Age, that the production and export of copper truly grow, reaching a peak in the 13th century BC. This marked increase in production and subsequently export is partly due to significant technological developments in the smelting installations. The Late Bronze Age in Cyprus, as indeed in the rest of the Eastern Mediterranean, is the era of internationalism, growth, prosperity, and emerging social complexity. Cylinder seals and writing appear for the first time, but unfortunately the texts remain undeciphered. New sites are established inland in the agricultural areas and the fringes of the Trodos. Their location, their monumental architecture and large storage facilities, installations for the production of olive oil and metalworking workshops reveal an economy based on agricultural products as well as in the production of copper. The main urban centers, however, such as Engomi, Halasultan Teke, and Kition, are established along the coast in order to participate in trading activities with Anatolia, the Near East, and the Aegean. This international trade, which is almost certainly state controlled, brings to the island luxury goods such as ceramics, precious metals, and exotic raw materials such as ivory in exchange for copper. Some of these you can see in the British Museum, actually. Enkomi, located on the east coast, stands apart from all other excavated sites for a number of reasons. Some have therefore wondered whether this was the capital of Alashia, or even Alashia itself, at least for the earlier part of the Late Bronze Age. The presence of coppersmiths' workshops already in the earliest levels of Enkomi, dating from the 16th century BC, and continuously down to all the other occupation levels spanning a total of 500 years, shows the primacy of this site in the production and trade of copper. The copper produced on the island was cast into ingots of standard shape and weight. Although different types of ingots were used in parallel during the Late Bronze Age, it is the oxhide ingots which are the most common and most widely distributed. The type takes its name, oxhide, from archaeologists, this is what, not what the ancients called them, because the shape resembles the shape of stretched hides as depicted in Egyptian wall paintings. The earliest known such ingots and the highest number of complete examples were found in Crete. They date from the 16th to the 15th century BC. The latest examples date to the 11th century BC and were found in over 35 sites in Sardinia. Initially, all three Mediterranean islands, Cyprus, Crete, and Sardinia, were thought to be possible production centers. Although Crete does not possess copper ore deposits, while Sardinia has produced little evidence that copper was extracted there in this period. Cyprus is an island which is extremely rich in copper and has a very rich material culture related to the production of copper. And it is, it is the most likely source for the ingots. This has now been corroborated by provenance studies based on extensive lead isotope analysis undertaken mainly by the Oxford Isotrace Laboratory, led by the late Noel Gale and Sophie Stoss. 
Further support for this argument is offered by the plethora of ingot representations in a variety of late Cypriot artifacts. In Enkomi, a male deity standing on an oxhide ingot was found, and a similar female figurine also standing on an ingot is also known. This is in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. Furthermore, on three four-sided bronze stands, the most characteristic objects of Cypriot late Bronze Age metalwork, ingot bearers are depicted in processions with others bringing dedications to a divinity. The, small, the, one on the, the best preserved one is in the British Museum. Indeed, miniature oxide ingots found in Enkomi and elsewhere, and often bearing short inscriptions, have also been interpreted as votive offerings. Many have argued that these finds show that the need the Cypriots felt to place the copper industry under the protection of their gods. As already noted, excavations in Crete have produced the largest number of a complete oxide ingots found on land, and all those which uh, come from securely dated archaeological deposits can be assigned a middle of the 14th, 15th century date. Thus, the ingots found in Crete are still today the earliest known examples of this type. Where the particular ingot shape was established remains unanswered, but a new set of analytical data recently published shows that at least some of them were made in Cyprus. Initially, we thought that they were made from copper coming from somewhere else. Some of them are still made of that unknown source. Textual evidence for the export of copper in this early phase of the Late Bronze Age is found in Egyptian hieroglyphic texts. According to the text, the ruler of Isi, which is believed to be another form name for Alashia, in its turn identified as Cyprus, sends diplomatic gifts, which include copper, to the pharaoh Tuthmosis III on three different occasions. Egypt provides some more, even more invaluable textual evidence. They are the well-known letters sent from the king of Alashia, namely Cyprus, to the pharaoh of Egypt, and which were found in the archive of Telelamarna. The archive dates to the middle of the 14th century and is connected with the well-known pharaoh Ahenaten, the father of Tutankhamun. In five of the eight letters sent from Alashia to Egypt, shipments of copper are recorded. The fact that among those who correspond with the pharaoh, the king of Alashia is the only one who sends copper, has often been used as an argument to support the identification of Alashia with Cyprus. The Amarna letters, however, are also important for a number of other reasons. First of all, as vividly explained by Kitchen, and I quote, one other item of importance in these few letters is the political status of the king of Alashia vis-a-vis -vis the pharaoh of Egypt. He actually greets the pharaoh, wealthiest and most prestigious monarch of the time, as brother, just as did the kings of Hatti, Babylon, and Mitanni. Undoubtedly, this political importance stems from the ability of the king of Alashia to provide the pharaoh with copper. No less than 29,000 kilos of metal were shipped to Egypt in a span of 30 years at most. Considering that only a section of the correspondence has survived, the amount of copper is striking. The text also revealed that the copper sent was a local product and that uh, as much as 500 ingots could be sent at any one time. The discovery and excavation of a shipwreck off the coast of Turkey at the site of Uluburun showed that the cargo of this size was indeed realistic. The ship carried almost 10 tons of copper in a variety of ingot shapes, including oxide and planoconvex, and according to the lead isotope, they are all coming from Cyprus. Considering the probability that this was not the only ship loaded with Cypriot copper that sailed at that time, then the importance of Cyprus as a source of copper for the Eastern Mediterranean in this period is clear. The ship was also carrying at least one ton of tin, with the, and together with the copper, this would produce 11 tons of bronze. Papasavas converted this into finished objects based on published weights of contemporary weapons and tools, and he reached the conclusion that the Uluburun cargo could have produced 30,000 swords or 36,000 daggers. 
As he points out, this would have been more than enough to outfit an army such as the one led by Ramses II against the Hittites at Kadesh. No wonder the Egyptian pharaoh was so keen to receive the shipments of copper from al -Ashia. The copper would have been used, among other things, to produce weapons necessary for the Egyptian army. For the, from the 13th century onwards, Cypriot copper was exported beyond the Eastern Mediterranean. Oxhide ingots have been found as far east as the Kassite Palace of Dur Kurikaltsu, located near Baghdad, as far west as the coast of Languedoc in France, and as far north as Oberwilfingen in Germany, and as far south as Kantir in Egypt. And according to the lead isotope analysis, all these ingots, including those found on another shipwreck, the one on Cape Caledonia, are, are made with copper from Trodos. The complex exchange systems of the Late Bronze Age come to an end in the 12th century, as one after the other, the Mycenaean and Hittite kingdoms, as well as the city-states of the Levantine coast, were destroyed. Some have argued that at this time, Mycenaean refugees of high status arrived on Cyprus, bringing with them a number of changes, including the Greek language, still spoken on the island today. These are the so-called crisis years, which chronologically correspond to the transition from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age. Invasions from the north, the arrival of the sea peoples, as well as climate change causing drought, crop failure, and famine, and other natural disasters such as earthquakes have all been presented as possible causes for the crisis. Interesting, at this troubled time, Cypriot copper was exported even farther, as shown by the frequency of oxide ingot fragments in Sicily and Sardinia. At the time of the crisis years, therefore, Cyprus managed to ride the storm and survive by joining new trading networks which linked the Eastern Mediterranean with the Central Mediterranean and beyond. This is the story, yes, of Cyprus, surviving the crisis. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Indeed, I have argued uh, elsewhere that this is probably how the Phoenicians also began their um, search for the West, using these new trading um, networks. In the 11th century, the Late Bronze Age comes to an end, but not the production and trade of Cypriot copper, which continues to thrive in the Iron Age. The Iron Age is defined as the period during which iron predominates as a working uh, metal. And Snodgrass was one of the first scholars to suggest that the reason for this transition was the result of this wide collapse of trading networks which followed the upheaval of the 12th century. He suggests that um, regular supply of tin was disrupted, bronze could no longer be produced, and the people of the Eastern Mediterranean had to look for alternatives. This, of course, was iron, a new metal, whose ores are abundant, and it is therefore readily available. To put it in Pliny the Elder's words, deposits of iron are found almost everywhere. He doesn't even bother to say which are the main sources. Some have recently argued that the discovery of iron led to the decline of bronze as a strategic metal. The fact is that bronze continued to be used to manufacture vessels and works of high craftsmanship, as well as a great variety of other objects, such as architectural furnishings and furniture. Many of these objects were deposited, often in quantity, in tombs, or they were displayed in palaces and elite residences, or were dedicated in sanctuaries. The word strategic, of course, also has another very specific meaning. According to the Oxford Dictionary, strategic is defined as, and I quote, relating to the gaining of overall or long-term military advantage, end of quote. Indeed, iron was mainly used to produce weapons, and thus it is also this strategic significance that copper is believed to have lost. But one should bear in mind that even in the Iron Age, weapons were not exclusively made of iron. Bronze is particularly used for the manufacture of armor, helmets, and shields throughout the Iron Age. Bronze was also used for the decorations of the horses and chariots, as best illustrated in the royal tombs of Salamis in Cyprus. Copper becomes even more important in warfare later on in the Iron Age, when mentioned, when mentioned by Hipponax, a poet from Ephesus, uh, sorry, when it, it, it's used to make uh, these um, rams for warships. 
Several rams are known. They have been found in sites of ancient uh, battle, uh, naval, um, uh, um, naval battles. Um, and they usually weigh around 200 kilos, but there is one example found in Israel that is weighing 465 kilos, and this is thought to have been produced in Cyprus. Apart from the copper needed for the ram, one should also consider the significant amount of metal needed to actually produce a boat for the nails that were holding the, the wood together. Clearly then, copper did not cease to be a valuable commodity. Indeed, based on a text from Uruk dating to the Neo-Babylonian period, scholars were able to calculate the value of iron and to show that it was significantly lower, almost half that than the value of copper. This is evidently why, according to recent archaeological evidence from the copper-rich areas of the Eastern Mediterranean, actually reveals intensification in copper production early, already from the early Iron Age. In fact, the material remains related to copper production dating to the Iron Age are much more substantial than what is currently available for the Late Bronze Age. What happens to the copper industry, the Cypriot copper industry, and the trade in the first millennium BC? After the 11th century, the oxhide ingot shape was no longer used, and Cypriot ingots are no longer visible in the archaeological record, either on the island or abroad. The texts, unfortunately, no longer speak about the metals trade, and there are no extensive excavations of Cypriot settlement sites dating to the 11th century BC. If one takes this at face value and goes on to compare the Cypriot copper industry of the early Iron Age to that of the late Bronze Age, the logical conclusion would be that Cyprus lost its primacy as a producer and exporter of copper metal. At the same time, excavations in Jordan and in Israel have brought to light a number of industrial scale copper workshops dating to this period, the beginning of the Iron Age. And some scholars have therefore argued that production there was stimulated by a disruption in the production and trade of Cypriot copper. But in fact, recent field work in the mining regions of the Trodos and in the storerooms of the Cyprus Museum have brought to light evidence for copper production in this period. And these include ancient mining spoil heaps and slag heaps. Indirect evidence for the continuation of copper production and trade is found in the wealth of the 11th century necropolis throughout the island, which includes imported pottery as well as luxury goods, especially gold. According to Maria Yagovu, and I quote, to judge from the known early Iron Age cemeteries throughout Cyprus, the quantitative occurrence of bronze and iron objects, as well as of luxuries, increases steadily from the 11th to the 8th centuries, rather than suddenly after the 8th. And this we found when we have studied and chemically analyzed a lot of these bronzes from this period and found not only that they're made of bronze, but some of them are made of a high tin bronze. So uh, tin was available and this was not recycled metal. It's made from fresh metal. It is very likely that in the first quarter of the first millennium BC, Cypriot copper, rather than going to the east, it was fed to the markets to the west, namely to the Aegean, and particularly to Crete, where early Iron Age tombs and sanctuaries have produced elaborate metal artifacts, including rod and four-sided stands, which were locally produced. Perhaps this shift to new markets in the west provided an opportunity to Jordan and Timna, Feynan and Timna, sorry, to step in and satisfy the demand for copper in the Levant. But production at both Fenan and Timna came to an end after the 10th century, while in Cyprus it seems to have greatly intensified. The evidence for copper production from the 9th century onwards in the form of slag heaps, wooden supports, and other organic remains from the mines, which can absolutely be absolutely dated through the radiocarbon, are rich. The prosperity of the Iron Age Cypriot city kingdoms was obviously based on the production and trade of copper in Cyprus, clearly by this time had once again gained the upper hand as a source of copper. Written sources of this period do not offer much information regarding the trade of Cypriot copper in particular, or even the trade of metals in general. 
The lack of texts that mention the trade of copper may have to do with the transformation of the trading systems, with the transition to the Iron Age. As pointed out by Sherrod and Sherrod, and I quote, merchant er enterprise rather than state-owned exchange became the dominant mode of trading activity. As a result, they argue that, and I quote, this had important consequences for the nature of the documentary record, since trading activity was no longer reflected in state records and the literature of the ruling class, so that the economic history of the first millennium has been systematically distorted, both by the nature of the evidence and the theories have, which have grown to rationalize it, end of quote. According to Zaccanini, however, Assyrian historical sources, starting with those of King Tukulti Ninurta II, indicate that the Assyrians procured copper from Cyprus. Because of its geographical position, mineral and timber resources, the island was coveted, and in the Iron Age, Cyprus was vassal to the political powers that were competing for dominance in the Near East and the Eastern Mediterranean namely the Assyrians, then the Egyptians, and then the Persians. In the Iron Age, the island is divided into city kingdoms, the number of which changes through time. For example, in the stele of Sargon II, found in Larnaca in 1845, and dates to 707 BC, speaks of seven kings of Ea. Ea was the name of Cyprus in, in Assyrian while the prism of Esarchadon, which dates to 673 BC, provides a list with the names of 10 kingdoms as well as the names of their kings. The definition of the political boundaries of the Iron Age polities is extremely difficult. This is primarily due to the fact that the kingdoms, their power, and their boundaries were constantly being negotiated. We know that at least one of them, namely Gideon, was a Phoenician colony, the first to be established by this seafaring people. We also know that the Cypriot kingdoms were among the first polities in the old world to issue coinage. Indeed, it is through the coins that we sometimes learn of the rise or demise of kingdoms. A close look at the spatial relationship between the copper ore deposits and the capitals of the Iron Age kingdoms of Cyprus, mentioned in the prism of Esarchadon, reveals that apart from Salamis, Lydra, and Hitri, all the rest have copper mines at a distance of less than 15 kilometers from their capital. Located on the east coast, Salamis did not have copper mines anywhere within its presumed territory, and yet, like Engomi in the Late Bronze Age, Salamis must have been a major exporter of copper that was probably produced in the kingdom of Tamasos. Local demand for, for metal would have been significant. The metal would have been used to produce objects for display in the palaces, in sanctuaries, and in aristocratic burials, but also to produce weapons and armors for the armed forces and warships for the royal navies. Indeed, the archaeological evidence from the mines and slag heaps in the archaic and classic periods, there is a marked increase in the production of copper. The exploitation of and access to the rich copper ore deposits of the foothills of the Trodos Mountains would have led, in times of peace, to the forging of alliances. The landlocked kingdoms had to rely on the kingdoms located on the coastal areas that had harbors and were involved in seaborne trade for the export of their copper. It also may have been the cause of the strife between some of the kingdoms. Internal warfare seems to have been triggered by the wish to gain possession of the copper mines of neighboring kingdoms. For example, According to the historical and archaeological evidence, the Phoenician kingdom of Gideon, located in today's uh, in Larnaca, in the classical period began an aggressive campaign of expansion and as a result conquered the kingdom of Idalion and then the kingdom of Tamasos. It is believed that the motives behind this expansion are economic. It is the wish to control and profit from the extensive and productive copper mines of both of these kingdoms. At a time of turmoil and warfare, such as the 5th and 4th centuries BC, when the Cypriot kingdoms were trying to free themselves of 
their Persian overlords, the demand for copper would have been even greater. The kings had to supply their troops with weapons and armors, and the archaeological evidence clearly shows that in Cyprus, weapons were not solely, sorry, were not solely produced in iron. They also had to build their naval force and supply their fleets with warships. The kings, therefore, had a direct interest in procuring copper in order to reinforce their military power, or sometimes that of their Persian overlords. When Persia attacked Greece, um, the Cypriots had to send warships, but in the uh, phase of the battle, they switched sides and helped the Greeks against the Persians. So. The Cypriot kingdoms eventually revolted, and some of them actively supported Alexander the Great in the war against the Persian Empire. With the, war of with the death of Alexander, Cyprus becomes a prize in the wars of the successors, and finally becomes part of the Ptolemaic Kingdom of Egypt, losing all forms of independence. The city kingdoms were abolished, and the island was governed from Paphos by Estratigos, appointed by the king in Egypt. In the Hellenistic kingdoms, and especially the Ptolemaic kingdom, mines belonged to the state. This must have been true for the copper mines of Cyprus. Indeed, in an inscription found in the sanctuary of Aphrodite in Paphos, uh, there is an inscription referring to the Andistratigos Potamos, son of Egyptos, administrator of the mines, and this may indicate that the Stratigos was one, the one in charge of the mines. The Stratigos was the, the person in charge of the island in the, um, in the kingdom of the Ptolemaic kingdom. In 30 BC, after the death of Cleopatra, the last Ptolemaic queen, the island became a Roman province. In 22 BC, the Emperor Augustus put Cyprus under the rule of the Senate, and from then on, the island thrived under the established Pax Romana. According to Mitford, Cyprus entered upon, upon more than three centuries of tranquil obscurity, seemingly not prosperous and apparently well governed. This is a quote from Mitford. But more recently, the accumulation of new evidence led Dimitris Mikhailidis to amend this statement as follows. Archaeological investigation has now shown that Roman Cyprus was not simply not unprosperous, but distinctly prosperous. This prosperity was clearly based on the production and export of copper, which was intensified greatly. The need for copper increased immensely during the Roman period, not least because of the introduction of copper coinage, with which the Roman legions were paid. Production on the island was thus of a truly industrial scale. What remains today of the Roman copper workshops are the extensive heaps where the waste product of the smelting process slag was discarded. These truly massive anthropogenic features were formed over just a few centuries, which mainly coincide with the late Roman or early Byzantine period. Considering the size of the slag heaps, for example, this one in Skuliotisa, which has been estimated to consist of two million tons of slag, one can envision an extensive workforce that would have been employed in all the different stages of the operation, from mining to the smelting of the ore. Writing in the second century BC, Polyvius says that in the mines of Cartago Nua in Iberia, 40,000 miners were employed, a number which, according to Claude Domergue, cannot be far from reality. And this must have been something similar in Cyprus. We know from the text of Galen, that, who visited, the doctor Gallen, who visited the island in 166 AD in order to collect minerals to produce medicaments, that the workforce in Cypriot mines also consisted of slaves. If we take a conservative estimate of 10% copper being extracted in the smelting furnaces that produced the 2 million tons of slag at Skuriodisa, then 200,000 tons of metal would have been produced there during the Roman and early Byzantine period alone. And no wonder Pliny believes that Cyprus was the place where the metal was discovered. As in the Bronze Age, um, in order to be exported, the copper produced in the smelting workshops would have been cast into ingots of standard shape and weight. 
Such copper ingots of the Roman period are known from the Western Mediterranean, where they have been recovered mostly from shipwrecks. Unfortunately, not a single such ingot bearing an inscription naming a Cypriot mine has yet been found. Provenance studies, not unexpectedly, have shown that the majority of analyzed copper ingots from the Western Mediterranean have an Iberian uh, provenance. Furthermore, recent lead isotope analysis of copper-based coins from the official mint in Rome has shown that the raw material largely came from the mining regions of southeast Spain and Sardinia. Some copper from the mine of Limni in Cyprus seems to have been used for the issuing of copper coins during the reign of Tiberius. However, this does not contradict the argument for the importance of Cypriot copper for the Roman Empire. The mint of Rome is one of hundreds of official mints in the Roman Empire. For example, at the time of Augustus, over 140 official mints existed in the Eastern Mediterranean alone. As stated above, in 166 AD, Galen visited the mines of Soli in order to collect calcanthite, the copper sulfite, which he used to make medicaments. In one of his books, he describes in detail how this was produced, while he does not mention anything about the smelting workshops. Therefore, in the past, some scholars have argued that copper smelting on the island had ceased by the time of his visit, so by the second century AD. Thanks to field and analytical work and systematic dating of the slag heaps in this and other mining districts of the Trodos foothills carried out by the speaker in the last 20 years, we know that this is not the case. Copper production not only continued, but it reached industrial scale in late antiquity until it came to a complete stop after the 7th century AD. The intensification of the production on the island is in the period from the 4th to the 7th century in the so-called late Roman or early Byzantine period is probably related to the split of the Roman Empire and to the need of the Eastern Empire or Byzantium to have access to large quantities of metals having severed its ties with the copper-rich Iberian Peninsula and the Mitterberg region. This industrial scale production brought prosperity to the island, made visible through the construction of extremely large and beautifully adorned basilicas and other buildings. And they have mosaics. This is the one that was found two years ago by our colleague Frinihaji Christofi in Akaki, showing the hippodrome. The intensity of the copper production in the late Roman period must have been detrimental to the Cypriot environment. The huge amounts of fuel demanded for the smelters and for making supports for the underground galleries may have eventually led to the destruction of the forests and perhaps to the end of the copper production. Mattingly has convincingly argued for similar widespread ecological disaster in the mining region of Fenan in Jordan. The archaeological evidence for the mining regions show that copper production stops by the end of the 7th century. Probably this is a result as well uh, of the fact that at this time Cyprus is often the victim of Arab invasions and the island enters three centuries of economic decline, the so-called dark, age uh, dark ages of the early medieval period. Indeed, Arab texts from the 10th to the 12th century AD refer to the mines of Cyprus, but only as sources of copper and iron sulfate salts, which were used in the production of ink. Similarly, late, later European sources refer to the trade of Cypriot vitriol and other products from the mines of the island in the medieval period, but not of metallic copper. It is almost certain that mining ceased altogether when Cyprus fell under the Ottoman rule. This is clearly stated in the following passage by Seigneur de Villamont, who visited Cyprus around 1588. He says, and I quote, such is the position of this noble and fruitful island, which in fertility and beauty yields to no other in the world, and contains in itself everything which man needs which wish for. First, it has its mines of gold, which Cypriots have not yet chosen to show the Turks, no more than mines of other kinds, except sulfide of copper, which is used for medicine. By the 19th century AD, the ancient copper industry was all but forgotten. 
according to the geologist Albert Godry, who published a book on the geology of the island in 1859, the villagers who came across ancient slag heaps thought they were the remains of ancient volcanoes. It is not until the 20th century that exploitation of the mineral sources of Trodos and large-scale mining was resumed. It was Cyprus's fame as a source of copper in antiquity, which led modern prospectors from the US to come to the island looking for ore deposits which could be profitably exploited. As already in the Bronze Age, so indeed in modern times, the mining industry soon became one of the main sources of income for the island. Thank you very much.